episode number eight of British Strength Radio with Jack Clavette. Uh, the return of Jack Clavette. You were the guest on the inaugural episode. Um, certainly was, but thank you for having me back on. Um, I wanted to do this again for two reasons. Um, number one, just because you were a good guest. Number two, uh, because on the first episode, I feel that I kind of, even though I listened to it back and I thought, you know, that was actually really good, um, I got really kind of confused and uh, kind of... Uh, how do I say it? Um, uh, startled by the headphones, just the echo. The echo really threw me off. I kept tripping over my words. I don't felt. I don't feel like I could speak as freely as I wanted to at the time. You dealt with it really well. You think? I think I may have covered my tracks a little bit, <laughs> but it was the first one, so yeah. I still um, think there was some pretty good content. Oh, definitely, because I listened to it last night because obviously I was prepping for this one, and I thought, you know, that was actually really good. Um, if you guys want a intro to Jack Clavette, listen to the first episode of this podcast. Um, but uh, just to give you one or two points about Jack, um, he's won Britain's Natural Strongest Man twice, and he's placed fifth in the world's Natural Strongest Man. He's owner of Spartan Performance here in concert, and he's uh, a coach to elite athletes and um, regular people alike. Uh in terms of strength, conditioning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And before we go on, I'd just like to say, if you would like to support this podcast, um, head over to BritishStrengthMagazine.com and subscribe. It supports the uh, generation of new content. British Strength Magazine is a publication catering to powerlifters, strong men, strong women, anyone interested in gaining strength. We have the brightest minds uh, in UK strength sports writing for the magazine. We have uh, interviews, you name it. It's three pounds every other month, so um, <laughs> it's really uh, not that expensive for a whole lot of knowledge that you could gain. Okay, so on to you, mate. Um, what's been new since we last talked? Well, before I answer that question, I'd just like to second what you just said to everybody. I think the British Strength magazine warrants support. It deserves more support. I think it's an excellent publication. I think it's a brilliant resource, especially for the strength course. Sport, try it again, the strength sport community. But as well as that, even if you're not necessarily active within that, I think the information within it from all of the writers and the guests that you have, and for three pounds, it's a steal. So I'm going to look into the camera. You should subscribe. Alex is a good friend of mine. I subscribe to it. So definitely do so. And now I've forgotten the question. What's new with me? What's new with you? I don't think there's really anything new with me. It always seems like it's much of the same. Business is good from a business owner standpoint. There's always, you know, new targets or new goals with that one there. So we've got some cool things developing on that front. Inside the gym, training's going well, either through myself or the team that I work with. So we're getting some pretty cool results with you know the, the range of clientele that we've got. And you mentioned working with elite athletes, but you also mentioned the average Joes. And that's something that we really want to you know emphasize to people. You don't need to be an elite athlete to work with us as part of performance. All you need is the mindset to want to get better. So from that front, I wouldn't say it was anything new. It's results as always. Though on a side note, and I'm, I'll have to get better at this, I suppose, I've just had a book published. So it's my first solo published book come out called Spartan Strength. That was released on Monday. I've contributed to other authors' e-books and their published books in the past. So I've you know, co-authored and assisted in those. But this is the first solo venture for myself. Hence, I'm a little bit... Poor Riff probably selling it to begin with. Well, I've just received a copy, um, and I've been reading it with a review to, with with a view to review it uh, for the upcoming issue of the magazine. Um, what I have read so far, I'm probably about a quarter of the way through now. Um, I really like, and the main thing to me is it's basically like a book, which was almost written to fill in gaps in my knowledge. Because obviously, I started as a bro. I started as a bodybuilder. <laughs> so obviously, like... For example, the first chapter, Foundation Movements, um, it's all stuff which I didn't start with as a bodybuilder. I started out with Foundation Movements for bodybuilding. I guess were the powerless, weren't they? But they were done to a bodybuilding standard. Um, and you've got stuff in there like the press-up, done properly, <laughs> chins, um, horizontal push, horizontal pull, uh, vertical push, vertical pull. I'm trying to remember them all here. Uh, single leg... Um, I guess, in the extension, single leg, triple extension, I guess, isn't it? Um, exactly. We've basically, 
I wasn't too dissimilar to yourself. I'm not too sure if you've got to the part in the book, but you know, rewind 15, 20 years ago when I just started out my training venture. If you were to you know, tell me that I should really be focusing on the goblet squat, when I'm sitting there looking at, well, probably VHS copies of Ronnie Coleman squatting 800 pounds, was it for a double or a triple? Yeah. Weeks out <laughs> from the Olympia? I'm not interested in, you know, a goblet. Who? Look at that weight. <laughs> it's the same as I'm saying in the book as well. When I saw Marius Pujanowski destroying the field of World's Strongest Man, winning by the largest points total still, you know, and looking awesome in the process, do you think I give a rat's ass about retracting my scapula? Of course not. <laughs> so I was very much within that boat. But, you know, thankfully, I made those mistakes. In many cases, I paid for them. But I've looked to learn from those mistakes. So the foundation section that you refer to, that's pretty much the entry level that we take all clientele through at Spartan, irrespective of experience or ability, because there's a huge amount of value can be taken from that. And that's what we like to do with sort of any aspect of training that we do. We want to milk whatever we do for all it's worth before we progress to something. So sure, somebody could come in and probably be able to back squat reasonably well. But does that mean that I just start loading them up and they might get better at it? Of course not. Sometimes to improve, you've got to regress. And that's the value in the foundational section for ourselves. And uh, we'll come on to that in a mm. minute and go a bit deeper into how you would implement that. Um, but how have you set the book out in terms of the chapters? Like how, how is it laid out? What are the main focuses of the book? I'd have to give credit to my editor, John Lipsy, for that. He approached me to write the book in the first place. And he kind of gave me the idea, if we're going to write a book about strength, that can be an enormous topic, but we wanted to be very specific. What are the methods that I use successfully at Spartan Performance? Or what are the methods that I've used successfully, or more successfully, over the last 10, 12 years? As in, they're the ones that get results time and time again. So that was the way that it was approached from that point. It's not an all-encompassing view of strength training. It's the methods that we use, and we get a great deal of success from. But at the same point, we want it to read very easily. So the, the target audience would be people who train already, so that we're not looking to convert somebody to a physical trainer. It's somebody who already physically trains to some degree, or coaches. It's not too dissimilar to the training manual that my team members, my staff members have at Spartan Performance. It is the Spartan system, if you'd like, of how we develop clientele. So at the beginning, we start with the foundational section. Why? Because when we get a client through the door, yes, we'll assess them. Yes, we'll look at their goals. We'll speak. We'll find out a few things about them. But ultimately, that's the first step that we take. And then obviously, as we progress them as a client, as their training history develops with us, then we can look to progress from foundational movements into using what we class as key barbell lifts. From there, you know, because that's the next most important stage, we can look to then supplement that with either power development moves or hypertrophy-based assistance moves, and then beyond that. So it's very much written from the perspective of somebody who's brand new coming through our doors. What's the system that we would develop you throughout your entire career here? But as well as that, it's not just a case of we do this and that. Yes, we can show what we do, but the key thing for me, what I want to, the information to relate to the reader is, why do we choose those exercises? Why do we perform them that way? Why do I advocate certain sets and certain reps? You know, so it can be as specific as possible. What I wanted, I didn't want a wasted word within the book. You can read it, you can open it on any page, and my, you know, my aim, my ambition for it, is there will be something immediately applicable or immediately relatable. So, so you read it at a weekend, open it on page 96, don't know what's on that page. Something better be on there that you can then implement into your own training come Monday morning, and more importantly, implement successfully. Yeah, to be honest, I've got to say, I literally had a flick through the yeah. first time. Um, and I remember just stopping on the page where you were saying incline presses. Okay. Um, and you said you preferred a wider grip on that because it's better for shoulder health. Hmm. And I instantly thought I didn't actually know that it was better for shoulder health. And um, obviously it's something I need because my right shoulder is uh, a little bit dicky. Um, so, yeah. Key thing to also take with that as well, I can relay information about the movements and the general pros and cons of them. 
but as well as that the information that I'm presenting what I'm recommending it is based heavily upon my experience with myself personally I am after all my own first client but as well as that with the clientele that I've worked with I'm not going to pretend that it is the be all and end all of strength training simply put over the last 10 12 years and the environment that I work in with the clientele that I work with those were the most effective exercises and the hints and the tips that we suggest are potentially the wider grip on the inclined bench press has been most effective for those people. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it is the absolute definitive way, but in my experience, it tends to you know, be more conducive with that. And I think it's important to remember that whilst you're reading it. You know, yeah. I'm not presenting the law. I don't think there is such a thing. I'm not really a fan of absolutes, but certainly I can present a long period of experience, both personal and thousands and thousands of hours of coaching with probably close to you know, a thousand plus different clients. And that's that's really valuable. And I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at through that is, it's just those little gems of information that you can learn from other people that you could, that as soon as you stumble upon it, it can change things so massively. Do you get where I'm coming from? So, Absolutely. you could you could be doing something that isn't optimal for you, and you don't even realise it. And then as soon as you just kind of, like I said, I just flicked onto a page mm. when I first got it, and I was like. I'd never even considered that that was the case, but now I'm going to implement it. Now I'm going to try it. So once you've gone from the foundation lifts to the the, the main lifts to the yes. key lifts, you go to your weighted carries next, isn't it? That's the ne next chapter. It is. Yes, we include loaded carries. I'm a huge proponent of those. I've wrote extensively on those for various publications, various magazines. Anybody that's heard me speak before, or even been, you know being coached by me, I'm a huge fan of loaded carries for pretty much any population for any goal, irrespective of injuries that may preclude them from that. We do include a base form of loaded carries within the foundational section. To me, that is a key movement pattern, which you should milk for all it's worth. That being said, I do limit it to one specific type. Once you graduate so to speak, from the foundation section. And how long that takes are very individual to individual. And I personally wouldn't want to put a time frame on it. You can work through that at your own pace, get as much return from that as possible. But then when you progress into mastering the barbell lifts, so know yourself as a power lift, you've got your squats, your benches, your deadlifts, the real time proven big bang for the book sort of compound exercises. I do like to incorporate loaded carries, ideally every session. With clients like that if not every session then at least once per week and there is a range within them the return is just so great say you know i've got you as a client we've got another client there and another client there your goal is strength for power lifting we have somebody who wants to build more muscle for the purposes of bodybuilding and now we have somebody who wants to burn some fat i can implement loaded carries to be incredibly successful for your goals incredibly successful for theirs and for theirs as well so yes we include that one there though it might be used in conjunction with the key barbell lifts. Okay, so obviously powerlifting is my background. It's going to be the background of a lot of people listening. Would you say that, like now I know that most powerlifters in the UK do not use loaded carries. Many in the world don't use them. Do you think that in a way we could be missing a trick here? Well, I, I would imagine well, okay. so. I'm not well versed in who is or isn't in the powerlifting world doing them. But to me... I personally, if they are implemented correctly in terms of technique, programmed accordingly, so it's not like you're running yourself into the ground doing them three times a day, seven days a week, I don't see a downside to them for the powerlifting athlete. Does improving maximal full body strength benefit somebody like yourself? Of course. Okay. Does the ability to brace, secure, maintain that brace whilst performing reps, or in this case, moving, does that benefit an athlete like yourself? Yes. A load of carries will help that. Yeah. I'm assuming that having a stronger core, so we're talking everything from the neck to the knees, 360 degrees round, if you can maintain a more rigid, a stronger torso, will that facilitate stronger squats? Absolutely. It's your, it's your weak link, isn't it, on a squat? It's your, your torso is your weak link. Exactly right. Squat. Now I'm looking at a guy who uses hook grip for you know, the 350s, 360s and above on the deadlift. Grip strength's got to be pretty important as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I could go to simple, the tighter that you can grip a bar, the better you can deadlift. Yeah. 
grip can be taken care of with loaded carries. The benefits are immense. And the thing that I like about them, probably not the most, but something that I love a great deal about them is the learning curve is very low. They're not particularly complicated to learn in terms of technique, so there's not a huge amount of training time required to be devoted to them. I'm a fan of weightlifting, Olympic weightlifts, but the amount of time it would take to potentially get you proficient enough to benefit from them in the session might be counterproductive for the time that you can dedicate to training per week. Not the same with loaded carries. It could improve your overall GPP, your general physical preparedness, your fitness to train, and your ability to train. To me, there's just a huge amount of value can be derived from that. And I'd imagine at some point, at least throughout the year, you and many other powerlifters will be injured. Yeah, whether that's you know an upper body injury, a shoulder injury, you know, I'm an expert in being injured, lower body injury, maybe loaded carries can be something that you can do whilst doing that. Yep. I don't know if you've seen our on my social media recently, um, I normally get a lot of laughs mainly when I'm using an implement called the power pull. Oh, yeah, that's a funny looking thing. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah, Bar <laughs> Barrack and Summer's attachment. <laughs> yeah. Everybody laughs at it. it. Well, the majority of people mock it, but I don't know if you're familiar with the history of it. I, I think I might be. Chuck was Chuck exactly the guy. Right. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, where yeah. the name comes from. Yeah. So I believe when he moved at the time to Lex and Barbell, they started selling it. So he started using this implement. In fact, if you watch the West Side versus the World documentary, yep. which is an awesome documentary fascinating to watch on some of the footage you will see him using probably one of the first iterations of this right basically it's a great way to really stress the spinal erectors the glutes and the hamstrings you've got a harness you actually don't even have to carry anything within your hands as much as i'm a fan of loaded carries sometimes it's nice not to have to rely on your grip strength to get that benefit coming from it yeah so he was the guy that pioneered it but I actually spent some time over in Connecticut with Derek Poundstone at the height of his strongman sort of success. And he was a guy that before he became successful in strongman was a great power lifter, but he broke his back. He had severe back injuries and he managed to overcome that and then do some phenomenal things within strongman. If you look at those movements, those exercises, they aren't conducive to back health. Short term, never mind long term. The sport's designed to break you. You know, the events are designed to break you as such. So when I went to his facility, well, I noticed that he had a power pull as well. And when I spoke with him, he explained to me how he used it, etc. So basically, I ordered one, got one built. It's a fascinating tool. Definitely something that could benefit power lifters. And at the end of the day, if it's good enough for Chuck Vogelpohl, if it's good enough for Derek Poundstone, I would hasten to guess it's probably good enough for you as well. Yes. Uh, I actually saw you uh, with uh, Chris. Chris uh, Chris was doing, I think, Chris oh, was doing Chris a plans, loaded, yeah. loaded carry with the power pull. Yes. Wasn't he? Yeah, so I thought that... I can imagine his back was on bloody fire. Well, especially the spinal erectors, but what we're looking at, if I remember rightly, he may have had a 28 kilo, maybe a 32 kilo kettlebell. Not a huge load when you look at what the spinal erectors, the glutes, the hamstrings, the quads there in play, they could actually move with. But it's not necessarily about loading super heavy. We can achieve a huge training effect from potentially lower loads at a slower pace. I think in the video in question, Chris, who was, at the time was pursuing powerlifting, had quite a few injuries that basically meant we couldn't get him under a barbell to squat and deadlifts were out. So then the training, we have to get a little bit creative. How can we strengthen or at least maintain that lower body development if you can't get under a barbell or if you can't deadlift? Power pull was an invaluable tool. That's a little bit more specialist. Acquiring one may be a challenge for some. But everybody has access to dumbbells, to kettlebells, to something that they can perform a variation of farmers walk with. So, yeah, I'm a huge fan of them. Um, if we quickly touch on how, for example, for a powerlifter, mm -hmm. would you implement, um, would you, like, where, whereabouts in the session would you implement a loaded carry? Maybe how many times a week would you implement a loaded carry? Um, just give me, I, I know you're not a fan of blanket statements, but no, if you could just give, give me an example. I'm going to assume that we haven't worked with this individual before. We're not necessarily well versed on their work capacity or more importantly, how can they recover from a session? It might be a great tool, but if I implement it and it severely impacts their recovery so they can't be as productive come the next session, there's too much negative carryover, then it's counterproductive. The base level would be a farmer's walk and that would be bilateral, so a weight in each hand. And we would look to implement that on one session per week. And that would depend on what their training structure is like. But let's assume they're following a typical four-day split. Yep. So you've got a squat day, bench day, deadlift day, overhead press day. 
I'd like to include the farmer's walk variation towards the end of a squat day or towards the end of a deadlift day, a lower body day. It doesn't really matter whether it was a squat or the deadlift, whatever they would respond to best. I would keep the sets, the distance, the load low, basically put them through the foundational section of loaded carries, right. how to pick them up, how I like to grip them, the fact that they won't be wearing a belt, how I like them to move with a rigid body, so to speak. We would start with once per week with the less is more approach. We're not trying to break the world record in farmer's walks. There's two different types of loaded carries. There's loaded carries for the general population, general training, or even a power lifter. And then there's the farmer's walk that you might see at the final of World's Strongest Man. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're carrying an object, but the specifics are completely different. They have to get they're from point to A to point quickly. B as fast as humanly possible, most likely with a horrible object, possibly with you know poor warm-ups in advance, or they might have done two or three events before with more to come after them. That's slightly different. How we would use them and prepare them is probably different. But coming back to this hypothetical power lifter, get them doing farmer's walks once per week. We'll see how they respond from that and we can go from there. Ideally, I would like to implement a form of zercher carry. So you're familiar with the zercher squat. Yeah. So basically a loaded carry, but holding a barbell, preferably an axle, because it is a little bit more comfortable on the arms or best case scenario, a strongman log has a greater diameter. Right. It's more comfortable to hold, but with a larger diameter, the center of gravity is further out from me. So basically there's a greater core engagement. There's a greater upper back engagement. Plus it works the biceps and pecs, and I don't care who you are. There's not a man on this planet that you know probably wouldn't appreciate better bicep development or pec development, irrespective of sport. Absolutely. So that's a great one to use. We probably look towards that. We also do a fair amount of overhead carries, but we've got to be careful with that. And I'm probably going to typecast again as well. I find a lot of power lifters are great horizontal pressing, but they're incredibly tight around the pec, deltae, and even the lats. Many of them can't get the hands above the head there. So if they can't press, you know, in a pain-free range of motion yeah. above the head, then the answer to developing upper back strength and core strength isn't putting a loaded barbell over the head and getting them to walk great distances. <laughs> no, probably not. So we will start simple, a farmer's walk, potentially or ideally adding in a zercher carry. Maybe that's as far as we go. Depends on the individual. Okay, so... Um then kind of following on in your book, once you've got through the uh, loaded carries, the hypertrophy stuff, um, you've actually, towards the end, the, I guess the main part really is you, you describe how to put everything together. Yes. So I'll take a programming section and I'll admit that wasn't necessarily always planned to be in there. We spent the best part of a year preparing the book. Now that wasn't necessarily a case that took a year to put all of those words down on the paper. It was simply taking our time and being very judicious in terms of what we put in there. Remember earlier on I mentioned I wanted every word to count, every sentence to be immediately applicable. Basically, I wanted no fluff within that. And programming, that's an immense subject. That can be incredibly in-depth, but also incredibly varied. So I had to be very conscious in terms of the information I'd been relaying, the type of audience that I was trying to speak to. But what I didn't want to do was leave people with these are the exercises that I choose. These are some tips about them. Go and do it. I want to give a snapshot of how I would then begin to incorporate them into a program. And I hope, I feel like I've done that in a fairly easy to read, easy to assimilate way. I'm hoping people will be able to understand the logic of the process that I go behind. I do give sample programs, but also explain the what's and why's about them. It's just important to note that it is a sample program. It is a hypothetical scenario, so to speak. It's not the only way to program, but I do believe there's a lot of value within it. It's probably the section, sorry, that I, once the book was completed and I got to read it again and also the feedback that I've had initially, that's the chapter I'm probably most pleased with, how it's turned out, because it could have became a very convoluted, very complicated chapter. I might not have answered anything, but talked about a lot. I hope, or I feel I've hit the nail on the head. Yeah, getting people to understand things and how understanding how and why to apply things is can be difficult but it's so valuable when you're able to actually get that across isn't it it's immense success comes from application i believe in the information that i've relayed in the book 100 percent. it's just words on paper if you get a program from myself maybe it's the world's greatest program it's probably not it's just words on paper maybe you write the world's greatest program or whichever world-renowned coach you get if they were to program you a program 
or a training session, it's just words on paper. That in itself does not guarantee success. It's the application of the individual to every set, to every rep, or in this case, the programming section. So if we can facilitate that by having easy to read, easy to assimilate information that can be readily applicable, hopefully that means they're gonna get better results from that directly from using the book. Or at least that's my hope. Yeah, I mean, like I say, from what I've read so far, really, really impressive. Thank you, Something I'm going to be uh, implementing with my clients, with myself. Um, yeah, and I, I'll, I'll look forward. I look forward to completing, you know, the rest of the book. Um, where can people get it? I'll put the link up on uh, on the YouTube description and whatnot. Uh, Certainly, but- they can purchase it direct from my website. So that's SpartanPerformance.co.uk. We have a Spartan Strength section. You click on there. There's a huge amount of information about the book, the sample chapters, etc. They can order from there, or you could go with my publisher, ironlifemag.com. You can also purchase it from Amazon, and I believe as well that it's going to be available overseas in bookshops as well. I think it's just been picked up this week by a publishing house. Wonderful. So many places to get it. No excuse. Get your copy. Yes. Buy it. <laughs> Um, okay, so switching gears a little bit, um, let's talk about what's kind of just, almost just gone down in, in Strongman, um, well, Strongest Man, Yes. Uh, Martin Lesis, the winner, mm. um, and then we had three three British guys in the top 10, so we had Luke and Tom Stoltman, I can't remember which way around the world, but they were fifth and seventh. Um, I believe it was Luke, placed higher than Tom. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then we had uh, Adam Bishop ninth. Yes. So <laughs> things have things really seem like they've kind of changed in in my in terms of like uh, the type of guys who are winning now. The uh, it's a changing of the guard. In, in a terms way. of who won with Martin's. Well, yeah, obviously him, and then there are a few new guys like breaking into um, like Luke and Tom. I mean, you know, with me not being an expert or much of a connoisseur of strongman, I will admit I have an interest. Hmm. But it's a passing interest. It's not a passion. Um, it just seems like Luke and Tom really snuck up. You, I think you, those that know them know what they're capable of. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting. I don't know Tom, but I do know Luke rather well. He trained here for a few years. He's a really good guy, so I'm delighted to see him get the success there. Same with Adam Bishop. You know, I consider him to be a good friend. He's came in uh, actually taught myself and he's taught my team. You know things about strength and conditioning, partly through his role down at Harlequins. Yeah. And he's a great athlete, a very smart one at that. So it's nice to see them getting their just rewards and nice to see them placing higher. I'd probably say the change in the guard is more so from the British scene. Obviously, Eddie's retired. Terry Hollands, I believe he's trying bodybuilding right now, but to be fair, he's probably at the end of his career. Yeah. Lauren Charlie, unfortunately, another horrendous injury. Mark Felix, well, fuck, I mean, he's just fucking an enigma. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't think he ever ages. Where, where, did, where did Mark place? I'm not too sure how he placed at Worlds, but, I mean, he just broke another world record at the recent Giants Live. Christ. In the Hercules Hold. I think they ran out of time. The arena was closing, so they told him to put it down. You know, <laughs> in fact, the first ever strongman show I ever went to see when I was probably 18, so we're talking more years ago than I'd care to admit, that was Mark Felix's first show. And... I'm sure he was close to in his 40s then. He's a phenomenal athlete in terms of aging. So, but their placings are dropping down a little bit. Now you've got the likes of the Stoltmans coming through. You've got Adam Bishop progressing as well. I know Graham Hicks wasn't at Worlds this year. No, he had a baby, didn't he? But at the same time, he's you know capable of great things. He's and his strength is immense, especially the static strength. So, there's a changing of the guard there. I don't read too much into it in terms of the final placings because because as much as I love strongman. I love World's Strongest Man. I also have to readily acknowledge that it's a television show with too many competing forces behind the scenes, which really detract from the actual event itself. If you check the uh, YouTube videos, the diaries that Lauren Charlier puts up, you look at the injury that he received, but he'll also show you what really goes on behind the scenes at a competition like that. So case in point, I believe they didn't even find the events out till a week, 10 days beforehand. That is mental. Not only the events, but the weights. And then I believe, well, I could be wrong, the York event that was in the final only actually got put in there to facilitate a sponsor, whether that was better for that. Uh. And again, I believe the first group, Thor's group, the one where he damaged his foot, they may have miscalculated the weight on the Yorks by over 100 kilos. 
That's crazy. <laughs> exactly. And it's a TV show, so when they're setting up the events, they may go to the wherever it's going to be. For 8 o'clock in the morning, or maybe 3 o'clock in the afternoon before they actually get out to do anything. Or they may go out and there's clouds there, or the crowd's not the right person, so the athletes have to come back in. They're like, misloaded kit? Could you imagine that? The Olympic finals. <laughs> right? It's the guy's third lift, he comes out for the snatch. The world record's 205 kilos. He's going for 207. And they misloaded at 225. And they go, oh, hard lines. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's, it's unthinkable in most sports. So you've it? got those factors at play. So obviously Thor received that injury. I don't know how debilitating it was, but it certainly sounds like a painful one. So was the result a true change in guard at the top? That's not to doubt that Martin's performed exceptionally well. He had a great Arnold's competition earlier in the year. But it's a little bit difficult when the sport is, you know, the, the pinnacle of the sport is really a TV show. Yeah. There's, there's not really standardised equipment or standardised events. You know, it sounds like I'm, you know, just, just slating them. I'm not. But when you look at the results, you have to take in those other factors to appreciate them. That being said, the guys that survived, awesome. I guess uh, it has a lot to, you know, adaptability has a lot to be said for it within the sport of strongman. Just how, obviously strongman is what you would class as functional strength and that mm. you're, you know, you lift in odd implements all the time. That's what all the events are, really, apart from maybe one or two of the static ones, and even they're odd. Yes. Um, I guess just being able to adapt to every single situation, things being less than perfect, it, it's completely different to, to what I do. It's powerlifting whereby you're almost guaranteed that it will be on this equipment, that equipment. Exactly. And then when it's not, people... <laughs> People don't half kick up a fuss. Well, you've got three specific lifts. So you know fine well you're going to go into a competition. It will be the squat, the bench, the deadlift. Not the deadlift, squat, the bench, whatever. It is, yeah. It's very regimented like that. And I like that. At the same time, I love the fact that Strongman can be very dynamic. There's multiple events. It's testing various qualities. I'll freely admit that's what hooked me from a young age. Yeah. Seeing trucks being pulled and Atlas stones being loaded, etc. Tires flipped personally for me, it was far more exciting than seeing a bar go up and down over a short range of motion. So I get that it's different in that regard, but at the same time, again, I don't compete now, and certainly not to the level of these guys, I'm pretty sure those guys in that position would appreciate a little bit better structure, whether that's actually even known when a competition is going to take place. I don't believe they have a season, it just comes whenever they get put on. Uh -huh. Knowing the events so they could prepare in advance. Like These guys are strong, they're incredibly strong, and they're probably well versed in carrying a yoke but to be ready to move a 600 kilo yoke after already done a farmer's walk and a lighter yoke prior to that you know maybe giving them that information they could prepare better not just for themselves in terms of their health but they could put on a better show as well yeah it's better viewing it's mm. you want to see records be broken you want to see unthinkable like feats of strength of course don't you um and they want to break those records, so it, it goes towards more than one uh, more than one eventuality. It can be it? a little bit frustrating, but yeah. nonetheless, some tremendous performances. So, I was just thinking, uh, in terms of the guys who we're seeing now from the UK, obviously Graham's just won Britain's. Hmm. Um, Luke and Tom have both had great uh, results at Worlds. Um, we've just seen uh, Adam Bishop. Um, Pull 440. Yeah, deadlift, which it was, looked it was awesome to watch. Lovely, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like if he, if he, like if he actually allowed himself to hitch, I think there'd be, there'd be more there too. Well, it's not just allowing himself to hitch. Although I personally feel like he benefits from his technique. Yeah. He's a very strong guy, but what impresses me most about Adam is he's an excellent technician. Yeah. But imagine if he could just focus solely on the deadlift, because bear in mind he pulled that 440, knowing that he had to then go and do four more, four or five more events within a two hour period straight after. There was other guys within that deadlift competition who were only there to deadlift. Yeah. So he had to pull a big weight to claim points, but then also know that he's then gonna to have to go through a full strongman competition. You know yourself how taxing it is to do three squats, three benches, three deadlifts. Yeah. Now imagine, you know, going to that, you know, for him I believe was a personal best on the deadlift by a big way, mm -hmm. but then having to do all those other events as well. I think he's capable of really big numbers on the deadlift if he was able to have the time or the inclination to focus on it solely. You just need a little bit more on the overhead there, Adam. That's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> um, because he's he's only light too, isn't he? Like comparatively, he's only light. Is he still around 130 or has he put some weight on now? 
if I had to guess, and it has been a while since I've seen him, I'd put him in the 140s. Right, okay. Now that, in itself, who's the greatest, world's strongest man competitor of all time? Marius Budzianowski, five titles. What was he, 140? Never. I think at his biggest was in the 130s, but even then that would have been coming into the competitions later in his career. Um, I believe 2009 was his last comp at Portugal. He may have come in in the mid-130s, but I saw an interview with him saying, well, obviously with the heat and the duration of the competition, he, was, he lost five, six kilos before the final. Wow. So he would be tiny by these standards, but you know, Adam Bishop is more along those lines. Yeah. If you look at the likes of Thor, Brian Shaw, they're about the 200 kilo mark. There's Tom, 150, 160 kilos. So yeah, sure. Adam is smaller, lighter in body weight, but that could also work in his favor. Maybe that facilitates him in the moving events, or maybe that facilitates his fitness event to event. Yeah. But at the same time, he's progressing slowly. He hasn't been an overnight sensation, so to speak. He was a great 105 strongman. I've got a great picture of him, him and Graham Hicks, in a 105 competition, if you ever want to see that. Is it? Is it that kind of, uh, that black and white one, where they both That's look the one. really thin? Yeah. Yes, they look starved. They look amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but that was them at 105, and he's progressed slowly and slowly. Potentially, that leads to good things, because you know fine well that you can keep developing strength right in through your 30s. So he probably has a great deal to go. It's not like he's maxed out in any capacity, or I hope not. I'd love to see him do well. Yeah, he's super intelligent as well. Like you say, he's strength and conditioning for mm. Harlequins. You don't get that job if you don't know how to basically look at the needs of a sport. And no, he's a good guy and a smart yeah. coach, so and a great athlete. So who who out of all the guys in the UK, including Graham, including everyone who mm. competed in Worlds, plus Graham, plus anyone, who who do you think's really, in your opinion, who's going to be the one to watch in the next five years, two years even? Okay, if we go two years, then I would say Adam and Luke. Right. For the reasons that I've mentioned for Adam, especially in the two-year period, if he gets to make a real good go of this and commit maybe more time to training, etc., to build on his body weight, which he's intimated he's going to be doing, I think we could see some very good things because he's smart and he's consistent. I also believe Luke, is, he was the only guy at World's Strongest Man in the finals with a full-time job. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So he works a lot of the time offshore. And I know that he was looking to maybe not do that for the season coming up. How strong could he get? How much could he better could he improve if the training for strongman was his sole venture? So if he does get to do that, despite having been on the strongman scene a while now, maybe there's a great deal more that he could go from. But you can't overlook his brother Tom. You know, he's in these early twenties, six foot nine, hundred and fifty something kilos, without a great deal of effort. You know, he is just, you know, genetically gifted in that regard immensely good at stones i think he broke another stone lifting world record recently in the last week or so up in scotland so you could say that he has the most potential but that to me is from a physical standpoint mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the most physically gifted individual becomes the most successful especially in a sport as brutal and as demanding as strongman it has to be what's in there as well yeah so you definitely look at those three they could go that way i bring graham hicks into it but I believe his focus is switching more towards powerlifting. Is he not competing in big dogs in Australia? He, he is competing in big dogs. Um, if I remember correctly, big dogs is towards the end of the year this year. Um, I couldn't actually find the date for big dogs when I was looking it up. The, okay. It's towards the end of the year this year, isn't it? Cause yeah. it's, we've not had one this year. No. The last one was last year, yeah. Um, but yeah, he's uh, he's looking to, to go high on the all-time list. Um, Excellent. I hope I, he does. I it would be great to see. I think he's capable, definitely. Hmm. Um, through looking, like, he pulled 385 the other day and it just looked like he's he's just, he's literally, like, he's just, you know, welcomed a, uh, you know, a, a new child into his family hmm. and, uh, he you know, he's going to he's gonna be knackered at the minute, but he just said it didn't have much time to train today. Goes in, pulls 385, but it just looks so easy. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, and his benching, again, 260, looked easy. It seems like he's, uh, I don't want to say struggling with the squat, but it's bar position for him, isn't it? Because his shoulders are so jacked up from all the massive bench. He's such a big guy, especially for his height, for his frame. Yeah. The best of my understanding, you know, getting under that bar, that external rotation. Yeah. I believe he did a lot of safety bar squatting prior to that. Yeah. In competition, you have to use the straight bar there. So. Yeah. But, I mean, he's got a great coach in Sebastian Oreb. Yeah. It's not like Graham doesn't know a thing or two himself, so I'm sure if he wants it. You'll find a way to get underneath that bar for the three lifts that it takes. Yeah, I'm. I'm. 
I guess I'll speak for everyone in the UK saying we're certainly all rooting for him. Um, it'd be nice to Absolutely, see him yeah. and a British guy really get up there, you know, in terms of the heavyweight powerlifting. Because in the UK, like, we don't really have that many good, really big guys powerlifting wise. I might be overlooking. Are you someone. doing yourself a disservice here? You're not too bad. You're not too shy. Yeah, but I'm not that. Bi- I'm, I'm I'm pretty decent, but I'm not that big. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. He's a big guy. Big, big, big Alexander Clark, the Instagram name. It's designed to be ironic, am yeah. I? <laughs> um, no, but yeah, be good to be good to see how this kind of plays out with the. I wish him all the best. And you mentioned in strongman, you want to see records being broken. You want to see amazing performances. I'm getting more and more interested in powerlifting, but I'd imagine for you know for its fans already, the existing crowd, they want to see those things as well. Yeah. And I think Graham is definitely one of those lifters that's capable of doing it. And if a Brit, but only that, a Northern Brit can do that, even better. Yeah. <laughs> um, f- last thing to touch on, on uh, in terms of strongman stuff. What do you think of Lisa's? What do you What do you think his strengths are? Um, I've heard people say, like, comment on him saying that he's like a new breed of strongman. Like, what What do they mean? Um, a new breed. I haven't heard that. Like, one. like that he that he's that he's somehow different. That he trains differently. This, that, the other. Okay, I can't speak for why people would label him with that, and I'm far from an expert. Ask me about Pudzianowski. I've spent way too many hours researching Marius. Right. From what I see, from what I observe, but as well as that, obviously you know Donna Moore. She works with myself. She's spent many a time around Martins as well, so she knows him a bit better personally than myself. And she only ever comes back with a glowing report. Right. From a personal level, he's supposed to be a great guy. You know, obviously, big frame, big stature, naturally strong, willing to push himself in strength training. But at the same time, to the best that I understand, he's also very smart with his training. Right. So it's not just necessarily more food to get bigger, more butt weight on the bar, and that's it. I believe there's a method to his training. There's a there's a structure to his training programs. Very technical. Um, at a time when Larry Real, Larry Wheels was going around a lot of different people to train with, I watched the videos when he was I think he was learning a tire flip. Right. With Martins, and he might have even done some pressing with him as well. I appreciated the little bit of coaching that he got within that. It looked like he was somewhat clued up. Right, okay. So does that make him a new breed? I'm not entirely certain about that. This is only something that someone said to me. Yeah. Um, I think he's very well-rounded, so it's not like he is the best in any one particular category, but he can move very well, he can load very well, he's very good statically, and he's also very young. Right. And correct me if I'm wrong... I don't believe he's had that many serious injuries, big injuries, which is going to count. Because at some point in strong run, that's going to happen to the best of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so young, hungry, point to prove, brilliant yeah. to watch. It might have been, it might have simply been because he's, the, the person said that was that he's like 50 kilos less than previous champions. Well, I think he's closing that gap pretty well. He looked he's getting, pretty he, large. He is getting yeah, bigger. he's getting bigger. He was only about 150 though, wasn't he, this time? Only, yeah, yeah. It's felt one. But then again, compared to two hundred, it's a big gap. But at the same time, two hundred on six foot eight, six foot nine, yeah. seven foot frame, yeah. it's not out of the realms of possibility to get to that weight. That's why when we look at Eddie Hall when he was won worlds and he pulled that five hundred, the body weight he managed to pack on, on strongman terms, a much shorter frame, it, to me, is mind boggling. Yeah, he was huge, wasn't he? He was. <laughs> he was like. A... He's a record breaker in more than just one regard. Yeah. Let's put it that way. So, yeah. But no, I'm a big fan of Martins. I'm a huge fan of Kilowski from Poland. I don't know if you saw the finals, but the way he lifted the dumbbells in the overhead medley, that was unbelievable. It's well worth checking out. So there was a pressing medley, various implements, of which there were two dumbbells, had to be cleaned and pressed. You should check it out. Especially it. when you see how the other guys had to either get it to the shoulders, pause and press. It's tremendous. And I believe he just won at Wembley maybe a couple of weeks ago. He right. plays first, my um, Kilowski. Right, okay. Lissus was he down in third? I'm not too sure. Right. But you can't judge too much. A couple of weeks after Worlds, there might be that slight hangover style thing. Yeah. There's not many people can be on all of the time. No, and I suppose Worlds is the one you want to peak for anyway, really. Absolutely. If you had to choose. Certainly. Okay, so um, I want to kind of switch gears again. Um, and something that I'm interested in now interested in now i'll take an interest in now because i'm a father is the fact that you train kids here yes you train uh young athletes um so can you kind of give an overview of say for example 
I'm a parent. I'm maybe, I, w- I won't be a pushy parent. <laughs> That's one thing. I won't be a pushy parent like you're doing this. Do you need but- to tell yourself that again? You will not be a pushy parent, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> I will be. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but if I wanted to give my son the best opportunity to be um, athletically, just give him an athletic advantage in life, what type of stuff is it that you do with the kids here? Okay. Do the absolute opposite of what 99% of his peers, his population, his age group are doing. I'm going to preface this with the observation. I've worked with youth, youth athletes, youth clients, whatever you want to class it, normally from the 12 years and up over for myself, right the way since the beginning of the Spartan performance. And there's a guarantee. Every year, so if you take, take a, 12 year age, a 12-year-old age group, every year when new 12-year-olds come in, they are much more carrying much more body fat, much more unathletic, much more uncoordinated. Their skin is worse. They smell worse. Dead simple. They're not being exposed in any capacity. The majority of them, there are exceptions. The majority of them are not being exposed to any semblance of sport within school, any semblance of physical activity out of there. Legitimately, when we get that type of age group, and we want to try and get them to do something as basic as a squat once over, that was a very short learning curve. Now, sadly, it's not. Put an Xbox controller in the hand and they'll fly all over that. Huh. Yeah, seriously, the posture, everything is worse. So if you want the first bit of advice, do the opposite of what you see everybody else is. They do nothing. They're not outside, they're not on bikes, they're not playing sports, they're not doing anything physical. So when they come to us, it's almost like we have to regress beyond belief just to get them even physically capable of potentially getting through warm-up drills which is pretty scary that being said at least they're coming to us at least they're being proactive now you could also comment on the lifestyle factors and i mentioned the skin the body fat etc you look at the obesity epidemic and i would consider it to be an epidemic with us in this country but especially within those age categories case in point i do a lot of charitable work a lot of free coaching free training for a lot of the local schools and we looked at the health and wellness statistics and i believe it was the year seven and eight 36 percent of that age group within this local area were already obese 36 percent and the barely out of double figures barely into double figures it's crazy so there's my little rant because at the end of the day they are our future yeah and if we can get them active now if we can get them eating healthier now, making better food choices, better lifestyle choices, that's only going to lead to a better, more fulfilling life for them, let alone the fact that they may not necessarily then, you know, have issues. Seriously, we've got a... 10 years ago, we had a 13, 14-year-old swimmer, female swimmer, came to work with us. Stopped, we haven't seen her since. Came back to work with us. So that puts her in her early 20s. She has fatty liver disease and her knees are shot. And that is directly... Sorry, it's not directly, but she's a lot larger than what she was. Was she doesn't participate in swimming or any physical activity? You know that to me, that's something that I don't want to happen. So if we can have a positive impact. Apologies, I think that's my round over. What should your son or daughter be doing? Get them to a qualified coach. Get them moving as early as possible. Gymnastic clubs, you know that would be the first port of call. If you can get them to a you know a gymnastic club, they will take them a lot younger than what we do presently. Seven years is the youngest that we take. So we have a youth group, seven to 11. They'll then progress. We've got like a 12 to 14 age group and then a 14 to 16 age group. That's the hard and fast categories that we operate at the Spartan. Granted, somebody may progress further up those because the syllabus differs within those. Mm -hmm. If, you know, children will mature at different rates. So some would respond better to the training higher up. But at the same time, we don't rush them or anything else like that. Get them doing some sort of, not some sort of sport, as many different sports as possible. Mm -hmm. Especially young, it's not about coming to the gym and doing strength and conditioning. Yes, we do some semblance of that with the youth that we have. But in an ideal scenario, before they come to us at seven, they've been exposed to any type of sport and activity that the schools would introduce from primary school level and above. Get them to a gymnastics club. If they can... If they're good at gymnastics, then they're going to have a tremendous advantage over anybody else that's coming through the door and picking up the things that we do. That would be my first protocol. Swim, go for bike rides, anything, just be active. That would be my first piece of advice. 
Yeah, because what you're saying there, I guess it ties in with what I mean by I wouldn't be a pushy parent or I won't be a pushy parent in terms of sports because I um, there's something in, I'm sure you've read this book as well, Periodization, Tudor or Bumper. Mm. Um, there's a section, uh, early specialization versus multilateral development. And there was some study in Russia where it said that when the kids were specialized early in just one sport and they were pushed really, 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 really hard, they were out of that sport by the time they were yeah. 15. Whereas if a range of sports were picked and they just kind of do a bit of everything, yes, then they specialize later exactly so right. much better. And that's if you want to excel at any one particular sport later down the line. Right now, we're just talking about a young population getting them physically active, but most importantly, enjoying it in the process. So to me, the greater the variety of the stimulus, the greater the level of enjoyment, which is chance to then going to be linked to, you know, consistency in doing it. If they enjoy doing it, chances are they're going to keep that up. But as well as that, you then get to develop a vast range of motor skills and qualities. You know, you're not just shoehorned in to this one specific movement pattern. You use a javelin throw or a discus throw, right? And if you want to become the world's best, well, then you pretty much have to accept that you're going to develop asymmetries. Right. And that if you train to that level, you're going to have issues down the line, whether that be shoulder surgery, hip surgery, things like that. There's a cost to competing at sport at the highest level. There's a physical toll. Yeah, that's for down the line. That's not something that we want for them now. We want to expose them to as broad a range of movements, absorbing forces, coordination drills, teamwork, enjoyment. That's pretty much the remit that I give my coaches, because I'll be honest now. I don't manage the seven to eleven year old group. I just I don't coach them. My team takes care of that. But we have a you know, we have a, a syllabus, we have a policy, and that's based around enjoyment, movement, coordination, teamwork, things like that. Not well, we want to make them great footballers, but even then the footballers that I work with in the off season, not just now but in the past as well. Do you think in the off season, so in season they're playing with their teams, when the season ends, it's called classed as the off season before they go back to their clubs for pre-season, which has just started now with the professional clubs, that's their off-season. I'll tell you the one thing I will not have them doing, kicking a football or doing any type of running drills to mimic that sort of thing. Especially in football, especially at the pro level, they spend about 48 weeks of the year doing miles upon miles on hard surfaces. That's the last thing that they need to be doing. But again, with the children, with the youths, you expose them to as many different stimuluses as possible. And... I think I'm right in saying that you, in terms of the actual um, weight uh, lifting, um, if you if you can call it that, a lot of what you teach your young kids in terms of the movements is Olympic weightlifting. It's not squat bench deadlift, squat bench deadlift, right? It's just with a barbell, uh, okay. snatch so and clean, right? So if we were going right? to introduce weightlifting moves or even power, not powerlifting moves, but base barbell movements, squatting, benching, pressing, or even the weightlifting moves. If we have a certain population, or we have children or youth that we will bring into that, they have to earn the right for that. Huh. And that's not just based on birth date. They've got to master all the qualities beforehand there. Because my mind, if we start them on the barbell, we can't regress them to anything. Right. You know? So I like to focus on those areas first, progress towards that. If and when we get there, assuming they're not specializing within that sport for weightlifting, which all, all bar one of our youths are not, in which case, it is technique. Technique, technique, technique. Load is of no interest for me, especially in a sport that is based so much around technique, the technical aspect of weightlifting, but also the speed side of it as well. It's ab that's the least of our concerns. I don't want them to get competitive with weights or loads or anything like that. I want them to lift better so that they can lift longer, you know, reduce the chance of injury, but at the same time, we don't injure them in the process. That's not in my, it's not even in my vocabulary. That's a, that's a great explanation of what you do. And um, if I were to stay up in this area, I'd be definitely uh, bringing Logan to this place as soon as he was old enough. But then again, I suppose one or two visits every now and again for a bit of... You're not that far away. I'm not that far away, realistically. You're welcome any time, as yeah. true would Logan be. Um, so almost, we, we talked about some societal stuff there in terms of what's actually happened hmm. with, within the society. Um, and I was listening to our original podcast last night. Yeah. And you said, um, I believe that a man should be physical. Yes. And it was just it was just one 
one sentence in there. And I've been thinking a lot about that recently, about how society's going, how there seem to be less manual jobs, um, more reliance on desk jobs, things like that for men. Um, less of, uh, even though the fitness industry is growing, it seems like, you know, there are a lot of men out there who aren't doing anything physical. And it it just, it baffles me a little bit. And I think, you know, there's a lot, I'm a liberal person. I'm a fan of, you know what, do whatever makes you happy as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. But what do you, what do you think about it? Because I, I, I find it a bit odd. I, I'd struggle not to do any physical activity. I know there are other definitions to what it means to be a man, but you know, I don't know. It's weird. Like, say if I see see a girl who can deadlift two hundred kilos, I wouldn't want to be. I wouldn't want to be a guy who couldn't. Do you know what I mean? I get where you're coming from with that, and I've got probably very specific and decisive opinions on that, which I'll come to. But you just mentioned there before about the fitness industry never being bigger. Sure, it's more popular than ever. There's more gyms than ever popping up all the time. There's more personal trainers popping up all the time. But we as a society have never been more out of shape, never been more unhealthy. I mentioned the obesity epidemic, the amount of people that are contracting type, not contracting, but developing type 2 diabetes, etc. I'd give my little rant about the youth and the shape they're coming in. Don't get me started on what the adults are like that are coming through the doors now. You know, they are as far from physical as you could possibly imagine. You know, you used to have to get up and change the channel on the television. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, and now you've got a button. We used to have to, you know, we used to have to do various, Just I'm not talking about real manly physical tasks, but you'd have to get up and move to get something. Fuck now, you can sit down on a laptop, you can get your bloody shop and order off Amazon or off the supermarkets, it gets delivered to your door. I haven't done that, but I imagine they'd bring it through the door and put it into the cupboards for you. <laughs> Everything is just convenience beyond convenience. We are a sedentary population, and technology is enabling us to become more and more so. Pros and cons to that, I suppose. It is, you know, I appreciate technological advances, but what we've got is we've got a less and less physical society. That has an immense impact upon the health and well-being of that society, and that's not necessarily just physical health and well-being. I'm convinced that it's also linked with mental health and well-being. I'm no expert in the field, but it's certainly my belief that that's the case. Now, if you come back to my opinion, especially for myself, yeah, a ma- part of my identity as a man is to be a physical individual. doesn't mean that if I, you know, and I worked on farms from 12 years old, from building sites just after that, so I had very physical jobs when I was growing up. I don't have that necessarily a physical job right now. I'm at work right now. It's not particularly physical. So that, it's no disrespect to anybody that isn't working on a building site, breaking themselves to pieces or anything like that. But I think there's something very honest about that type of work. But at the same time, it's... Fuck, I'm a man. I need to take responsibility for my physical health and well-being, for my ability to perform and do physical tasks. That doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to judge myself on not being world's strongest man. I talk a lot about it. I'm, you know, I tried, but I'm not. I'm, I'm not Mr. Olympia or anything like that. You know, those are the pinnacles of specific sports. But to me, it's, I, I don't understand. I don't know what it would be to not want to be physically active, to be physically dominant in various aspects. I take a lot of solace within that for my own personal well-being, personal therapy. You know, I enjoy having the capacity to do those things. That's just being physical. I'm not talking about necessarily gym one rep maxes. You know, this, this body is a gift. I mentioned technological advances. We are still the greatest machine that has ever been made, the human body. If ethics weren't involved, how much do you think it would cost to actually genuinely clone a human being? Billions and billions, hundreds of billions. Yeah. We have the greatest gift. When you see somebody who was lucky, and that's what it is, you're lucky enough to be born healthy. Yeah? You make the most of that. Yeah? And to me, it leads to a more fulfilling life. I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily the question you're asking for, but I've got a tremendous amount of value in my pursuit of strength training. The qualities that I've learned under a barbell, under a dumbbell, on a farm, you know, doing hay bales, etc., that as a young teenager, there's a huge amount of qualities that I learned 
that transcended the farm field, the building site, or the weight room into life itself, which for me, it's about hard work. Hard work can and will be rewarded if you put that in as that work ethic side of things. So for me, it's been incredibly rewarding. So whenever I'm exposed to a youth individual, well, I don't give them the speech that I just gave you. We try and motivate them. We want to get them into that sort of physical culture from an early age, or it could be an older client, an adult coming in, you know, somebody who was once physical at school, but has been fairly sedentary. You know what it's like if you work in the nine to five and things like that, it's very easy to get caught up in that. But I want to, you know, help them out, empower them. Show them the benefits from that, or remind them of the benefits that you can get from that. For me personally, I just get a tremendous a lot, for, a tre- tremendous amount from that. So for me, it's very much important to be that way. Yeah, it can definitely be very, very additive to someone's life if they've not had it previously, just to get them a base level of strength, mobility, conditioning. Thousand percent. Yeah, you're preaching to the converted here. This is who I am as a person. It's who I am as a business. It's who I am as a coach. Um, so relating to this, you've obviously done a degree on, uh, you did Latin and ancient, the ancient, ancient Greeks. History. Yeah, ancient history, Latin and Greek, yes. Okay, so from what I understand, a gymnasium, did yes. that come from the from a Greek word which meant a place where you didn't only go to uh, train physically, but you went to you learn to... Mentally, of course, yeah. You've got those connotations. The, the reason that I, my gym is called Spartan Performance, nothing to do with the film 300. We were open, I opened around about that time that became popular. No, because way back in my GCSEs, the World Grammar School, we had a classic civilization class, and they basically introduced us to the, the culture of the Spartans. And the thing that really caught my eye, one of the immediate things that caught my eye, where at a certain point in history, they had a very militarized sort of society. The guys were warriors, but the ladies, the females, they trained alongside them in physical culture. Physical culture was a huge part of that. So the name Spartan, for the gym, Spartan Performance, training doesn't discriminate, right? It is for men and for women. If you put the time and the effort in under the barbell or the dumbbell, you can get your just rewards. But where does that come from? That comes from ancient culture in Greece. You come to gymnasium as well. It's not just a physical well-being, it's a mental well-being as well. The two go hand in hand. So in that society, basically everyone trained. like Within where, the Spartan society. Within the Spartan, yeah. within that society. Yeah. So whether you were a, you know, whether you were, I don't know, I guess they had, they all had different roles, but like whether you were um, a soldier or... Well, predominantly the ruling society with the Spartans, they were the soldiers. They were all soldiers. Yeah, they had right, you okay. know, slaves, if you want to class that, the actual indigenous population, maybe for the more menial task, if you want to class it like that. But basically every male citizen was a soldier within the army itself. Right, okay. And they were trained, you know, for that, that mindset, that discipline. And again, that appeals to me. It's a bit of a strange one. Um, I'm not saying everyone has to be battlefield ready. A soldier ready but I really you know I'm drawn to that discipline that desire to be you know physically prepared to be able to put that hard work in from a very young age you know those physical pursuits that really appeals to me the discipline for it but it wasn't just the guys granted those are the ones that went off to the battles but the ladies were involved in it as well and you're familiar with I-10 I Epitas so that's yes, classed yeah. as the spot and bottle <laughs> it's tattooed down my spine it's on our clothing Literally, it means with it or on it. So when, obviously, the, the men would go to war, to go to battle, the wives, the mothers would say to them, I tan, I epitas, with it or on it, return with your shield, as in victorious in battle, or on it, having died within it, but in the pursuit of winning. So if they were to return without the shield, as in they basically lost, but they left the battlefield, that was like the ultimate disgrace in the society. That excites me. Yeah. Total commitment to a cause, not necessarily having to die in battle, so to speak. I think times have changed. Society is a little bit different now. But at the same time, that total dedication to the cause. You can apply that definitely. Of course, like, you win and you die trying. Yeah? Maybe not literally die, but if I have a goal, whether that's a business-related goal or anything else like that, commit everything to the cause. And I'm willing to bet that your chances of success are far greater than if you put in a 50% effort or a 70% effort. You know, admittedly, I'm a very black and white character, but especially things that I want, I don't understand anything less than 100%. So I'm happy with how the book's turned out. I'm happy with the, you know, the comments, the feedback, the reviews, the praise that have came in at this early stage. 
I'm not going to sit there and say to you, yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, I put a 50% effort in. It's not bad. I give it everything that I had because I want it to be as reflective of the things that we've achieved over the last 10, 12 years. But to do that requires 100% effort. If I'm going to get any type of rewards from that, whether that be you know praise and reviews or even the odd sale or two, it's got to be down to the effort being put in. As we've already mentioned, you're a very, as we just mentioned there, you're a very goal oriented individual. And uh, I almost want to pray, I almost want to close with um, something about that. What goals do you have? Um, could break it into, you know, immediate goals, three to six months. Um, in terms of your own training, in terms of your business, anything else that's, um, anything else that's coming up? What's, okay. What First and foremost, I always speak from a business standpoint, from a coaching standpoint. That is the big thing within my life. Then it will come from my own training goals. So from a business perspective, the immediate is to ensure that myself, but also the team that I work with, we are as skilled as we possibly can. So that means we keep sharpening in our knife. So I don't care what course we did last year or if we had great results last week. It's what we learn now. It's what we learn tomorrow. It's the results that we get next week and next month. So we stay at the top of our game, constantly sharpening our knife. So that is mission number one from an education standpoint, from a skill standpoint as coaches, but at the same time ensure that our delivery is, is as professional as it possibly can be. And I think we've approached good levels of professionalism in the past, and I've also let it slip as well. And that's, it's not a constant battle, but it's something that you need to stay on top of. So that, to me, is always top of the list. Are we the best coaches that we possibly, possibly can be? Are we the best role models for our clients, young or old? That's number one. In terms of the business itself, are those passions, are those desires for our own personal skills relayed by the facility itself? Is the facility as good as it possibly can be at delivering the service that I want it to, or the level of service, to the clientele that invest with us? No, it's not. I'm satisfied with some things, but the things could be better. Ask me this six months ago, maybe some of the things I'm dissatisfied with now, I was quite happy with then. I'm never one to you know, rest on my laurels or to get complacent. I'm always looking at ways that we can improve the level of our service, whether it's our own personal training, our own personal development, or that of the facility it's itself. I've got some real big plans in that department, but I don't like to speak in ifs and buts. So come back to me in maybe two, three weeks' time, I might have some definitives there. Okay. But I want the business spartan to performance to grow in terms of the facility and what it offers, all encompassing in that regard. I want the staff, the team members that work within that to develop themselves, maybe even bring more into the team. That's my absolute priority. From a personal standpoint, I want to make as much out of the book release as possible. It's something that, I don't want to say there's been a bad thing, but I've been a very insular character over the last 10, 12 years. If anybody came to see me, if I ever met anybody, I love conversing with them. I love speaking about them. I'm happy to show the things that I've been doing. But I'm certainly no wizard on social media. I haven't been just putting content out left, right, and centre. Partly because I'm a technophobe, which I'm working on. But at the same time, it's because that's what makes me the gym floor next door. That's where I'm putting my time and efforts genuinely. So if we get these skills, whether that be knowledge, whatever else, or you know, just custom service. We're putting those to the test. I'm still putting those to the test working with clients. When this is over, I might have an hour to squeeze some training because what I've got clients and I've got a nutrition workshop after that. That's the key thing there. Those things have to be better for myself though. Now that the book's out there, I'm on podcasts like yourself, I'm now lucky enough to work with not only coaches from around the UK, but also gym owners as well. So I'll be traveling a lot going to obviously help different facilities. They can come to myself, but at the same time, I'll travel to them as well. I've got you know big ambitions in terms of what I want to do there. And it's also built around the reason why did I wait now to release a book? Well, it's simple. I wanted at least 10 years of getting results before I could think of ever becoming a semblance of an authority on a subject. Because prior to that, it would have been, well, I read this by somebody or somebody taught me it. Now I'm going to tell you it as if I did it. I haven't. Yeah, I need to put those things into practice. My business is about to be in its fourth lease. One, two, three, third, fourth different premises. You know, it's a successful business in that regard. So maybe I've got things that can help others in that. I believe I'm a pro whatever I'm a pro proven commodity in, then if I can get out there and help other people, I will. So those are other ambitions for myself. I've got ways in which I'd like to develop the book. 
It is very specific on one particular subject for a particular type of individual. That doesn't mean that there couldn't be a strongman specific one or whatever it may be. So there's things like that going down there. And then there's myself personally, because I keep talking about, you know, that I used to compete in strongman. I always get introduced as he was this, he was that. I'm going to give power lifting a go. Um, I've finally not been injured for a sustained period of time. I'm getting some consistent training under my belt, although I have had to learn how to lift properly. So I've had to learn to lift to, you know, competition standard for the bench. Squat was never really an issue for myself, so I have a competition in December, which I'm working towards for that. Just a local one. It's okay. nothing big, but the point being is I need to get up there and do three good lifts on the squat, three good lifts on the bench, three good lifts on the deadlift, and then we'll find where I am. Which, uh, which comp? It'll just be an inter-gym one. So right, we're going to okay. run so basically... The one which is on the on the post. Exactly right? right, yeah. So at the end of the year, we run a personal best day for our gym members, but we also invite other gyms if they've got anybody that wants to come and set those things. We'll revamp it this year so it does become a competition, prize money, etc. Yeah. But that will be built around the cornerstone of the squat bench deadlift on competition equipment to competition standard. We'll bring referees in. You'll be involved. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> I'll then see personally where I stand, and then that'll give me a good position for... 2020 to then decide if I want to push it on. I think I might have intimated in the previous podcast I don't have the same passion right now for powerlifting as I did for strongman. That was something that just came to me instinctively inherently. You know, I was drawn to strongman. I wasn't necessarily drawn to bench press. And having never competed, I love competing. I enjoy training. Yeah. But competition day for me, I love it. It's so enjoyable. I love the competitive nature of it. It doesn't overwhelm me, it never has phased me. I might not have performed as well as I wanted in some competitions, but it certainly wasn't because I was phased by the event. I love that. And it was always like that. It's intoxicating, you know, that feeling. Yeah. So that always kept me going back to the well training. Because remember when I was competing at the best and strongman, I was pretty much a one-man band trying to build my business at the same time. 80, 90, 100-hour weeks weren't uncommon, you know, and then trying to be a strongman on the side of those things. So maybe that limited me to an extent, but I'm not going to cry over that. But I was loving that. Having never competed in a powerlifting competition, I don't have that same love for it just yet. But at the same time, I need to have goals, I need to have targets, and I need to do something physical. And I think CrossFit might be beyond me just yet. <laughs> or at least at 125 kilos. So <laughs> we'll focus on powerlifting for now and see how it goes from there. Cool. Um, beyond that, five, ten years for, for, for Spartan, for you? Have you have you thought that far? Or yeah, do you absolutely. Like to- um, Within that time period, I would like more books, but more importantly, more relevant books that are very well received. Yes, I wouldn't argue with book sales, but it's the quality of the information that I can share. So if I can be in position within that time period to provide quality educational resources, then I'm definitely going to pursue that. I enjoy doing it. I feel like I have a value. I feel like I have a voice that it will be of use to many people, especially from the environment of a warehouse gym. I'm still pretty sure I was the first one within the UK itself. I don't just want to typecast us as that's all we are, but I do believe that I have value to bring to that, so I'd certainly like to expand upon that. That's a key thing for me. I also have ideas for my business itself. I could say about growing internally, but it's no secret I lease my premises. I don't always want to be a tenant. I would like to own and at the same time that would then give me the freedom to potentially pursue my ventures outside of Spartan performance right you know so I have those I'll be slightly vague on them not necessarily I'm deliberately trying to be evasive but those are what I would like I normally you know I'm a very absolute guy I'm going to do this and this is when it's going to get done by so I will lift on the 21st of December and I will hit 800 or above those are definite right whether they get white lights or not that's up to that's up for debate, but we're going to work for that. I definitely think you have potential to lift above eight hundred kilos. Are we talking? I assume we're talking sleeves, um, belt yeah. and sleeves. Yeah, belt sleeves. So I use the rebound seven mils. Yeah, so that's what I lift in. I'm most comfortable in those ones there. That's my deadlift that I need to bring up. You know, bench has always been decent despite not being a technically sound bench presser. Now that I've switched to that, it took a hit, but now it's building back up nicely. Yeah. So. I think that shouldn't be an issue. To squat above 300 won't be an issue. I'd be surprised if you didn't go above 800, to be honest. And that's not just blowing smoke. It's, yeah, based on your lifts, I'd be surprised if you didn't go above 800. Because if you think about it, 300 squat, you can bench over 200. I know you can, but let's just say 200. Mm. 
200, 200, 300, there's your 800. Dead easy. Yeah, the squat and the bench, I know that I could go and do those now. Yep. And get those now. The deadlift would be the issue. I feel I could do more on the bench, and I feel I could do more on the squat. But also, I've never done them in a complete competition. I've done them in a training session. So I've never hit that 300 plus squat, then had to go across and do a 200 plus bench, and then move across to the deadlift. And since my weakest lift from a tech, it's not necessarily a strength standpoint, but certainly from a technique and potentially a mental aspect, is my deadlift. But that's a pretty cool challenge to have. Yeah. I don't want to sit there and go, oh yeah, it's December, I'll just lift this. It's not like that. I've been, I'm reasonably gifted for strength. That's it. I've never been very gifted. Any sort of success that I had in Strongman is because I had to work at it. So I'm going to have to work doubly hard, you know, to get decent at this, but that's fine by me. Well, I look forward to seeing you doing it, mate. And uh, I look forward to this involvement that I'm going to have in the competition yes. that you've not let me know <laughs> what it is, but we'll, we'll I'm sure well, I'll find out. It's out there out. now, so <laughs> if you want, you know, you can refer back to YouTube or wherever you release this. I'll fill you in afterwards. Cool. Thank you very much, mate. Always a pleasure, Alex.